Welcome to the first part of our Heritage Talk on Uncovering Coles Hill. So I'm Natasha and I work at Wessex Archaeology, which is a commercial archaeological unit and an educational charity. So um, Wessex do develop, we do archaeology before development happens. So whether that's a housing estate or um, train lines, whatever disturbs the land, Wessex Archaeology will do an archaeological survey on that before the development happens. And that can be um, in the background, it can you might not even know it's happening. It can be death-based stuff, or it can be trail trenching or full-scale excavation works as we've been doing at Coles Hill. So we've got a map for you now. So HS2 has lots of sites, as you can imagine, along the, line, the, the lines of the train. So Coles Hill is just here on this map. And there's Birmingham. You can see all the other sites. Again, look out for webinars on these sites. The programme is the biggest archaeological programme in the UK and involves a thousand archaeologists. So now we're going to meet some of those archaeologists. So I will introduce our speakers for today. So I have Emma, um, Kat and Stuart, all from Wessex Archaeology today. And I think you've all worked on different parts of the site. They've so got lots of experience. Yeah, right. uh, to begin with, Kat is going to give us an update on, on the site. Hi everybody, good to see you again. Um, so we've had a very exciting time here at Coles Hill over the last eight months. Um, some of you will remember the last webinar we did when we talked about some of the um, Iron Age field systems that we've got going on and pit alignments going across the site. Um, we found a vast Iron Age landscape, including at least three Iron Age pit alignments um, and two roundhouses. Uh, you can see these in the picture below. The team are standing in one of the Iron Age pit alignments. So these pits were huge, they were sort of two meters in diameter, quite spread apart from each other, um, stretching a really long distance, a couple of hundred meters across the site. Uh, and then on the right there, you can see one of the Iron Age roundhouses. So we know we've got two roundhouses for sure. Um, since we last spoke, um, we then found um, a, a sort of area where there's Iron Age cremation burials, about 85 metres to the south of these Iron Age roundhouses. Um, it's early days for the assessment, so these samples need to be studied and we still can't say for sure what date they are, but going from their appearance, they're very typical of Iron Age cremation burials, sort of 40 centimetres in diameter, only about 10 centimetres deep. We had about 10 of them that actually displayed um, bone on the surface, cremated bone. And there was a further 14, so we might have about 34 in total, possibly, although some of them might reflect sort of areas where these charred remains have sort of moved through the, the water movement and, and gone down cracks and things in the landscape. And um, but there's certainly there's certainly at least 10 real good cremation burials there. And um, we've also been excavating a very exciting Bronze Age burnt mound just on the bank of the River Cole, which we've pretty much finished now. Uh, so I think Natasha's just going to show you a time-lapse video of that. We excavated it, the whole burnt mound in a series of two metre grids. Um, this is because the burnt mound probably accumulated as a consequence of multiple de depositional events occurring um, over a long period of time, not all of which will be visible to the naked eye. Um, so we need to carry out a series of um, sampling techniques, which tell us about the paleoenvironmental conditions and seasonal activity at the site. So from each grid square, we took micro fossil and micromorphological samples, um, which will tell us all about how that was made up, how those layers were created and how many different events were taking place at the site. Um, we might be able to get some um, radiocarbon dates that can date it quite tightly because burnt mounds often don't have very much dating evidence and um, there's nothing there was nothing in terms of artifacts no pottery or animal bone or anything like that it was very much just made up of sort of burnt stones um, and burnt material spread over a 15 meter diameter area and um, underneath the burnt mound which you saw in the video there, there is um, a sort of pit or trough feature with another little gully leading into another pit or trough. So it's obviously something to do with water storage and movement as part of some sort of process. Um, and uh, obviously they, they were doing some sort of burning or, or perhaps heating stones in the area, which may explain all the burnt stones and um, burnt material that's appeared on that area. So um, we've finished that now, but obviously we need to do a lot of scientific um, processing and studying those samples so we can learn a bit more about it. 
Oh, wonderful. And we're not exactly sure what burnt mounds were for. Just, you've got, just got a few different ideas that you've yeah. said. So it could be the the general popular ideas are a sort of a sauna or some sort of a steam area where they're heating water and using that for their leisure. Um, other people have suggested tanning and textile sort of production. Um, it could be some other sort of processes. I think late, later on people have talked about boat building, uh, but I'm not sure that's really the case uh, here in the Bronze Age. But yes, lots of different ideas what it could be all about. Still a mystery. I am going to um, welcome back Emma. We're going to move on to the manor site and she's going to talk to you about the history of the manor. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so we've done quite a few webinars now on the fantastic archaeology of our Colesville site. And through these webinars, we've explored those early echoes of settlement demonstrated through the Iron Age pit alignments, the increasingly more complex land use, as well as the presence of roundhouses, uh, burnt mounds and a number of cremation graves. We've also seen across the site evidence of Romano British uh, enclosures and field systems, which showed the progression of agricultural land use from the Iron Age period up to the Roman. But in all of these wonderful explorations, we've, uh, we've stopped before the Middle Ages. We've left out that very, very large octagonal moat that you can actually see clearly from the ground and also from Google Images. So this webinar will change that we're going to take you through the tantalising history of this enigmatic moated site at Colesville. We'll seek proof of its medieval origins by delving into the historical sources and see how they tally up with the results of our excavations to date. And by the end, I'll be able to show you what one of the rooms inside Colesville Hall might have looked like through a 3D reconstruction. So the site today is dominated by an ornate Gothic style red and blue brick house Although perhaps stately home might be more from a definition because it's quite large and the present Colesville Hall or maybe Colesville Manor as you know it as was constructed in 1873 but by the 1920s it was actually converted into a hospital which focused on the betterment and rehabilitation of the mentally ill but during the 1950s and 60s additional accommodation blocks were expanded on the ground towards the hall in the northeast but then by the 1990s the hospital had treated its last patient and the Gothic Colesville Hall was converted into a business park. Those accommodation blocks were demolished, new buildings were erected and the wider parkland that we see today was actually landscaped. But the Victorian Gothic Colesville Hall that stands on the grounds today is not to be confused with the Colesville Hall that we're searching for. And our elusive medieval Colesville Hall is not to be confused further with the Colesville Hall farm which stands on the site today. In fact, pinning down the exact type of building which lay within the arms of the moat and its earliest date is rather tricky to define. And as we can see from the sex image, it's not medieval. As we trawl back through the historic records, things become murky and we have three possible phases of the hall to search for. The most recent is the well-documented Elizabethan hall, preceded by the, Elizabeth uh, by the medieval hall and tentatively possible Anglo-Saxon origins, however, this is still to be proven. But beneath the rubble of bricks and mortar of that long dem demolished hall, there hides a story of treason and trespass bubbling through generations in a long, long feud. Now to better understand why Colesville Hall was so coveted, we must first look to the role of the medieval manor. So in the West Midlands, there are around 426 moated manor sites associated with the Forest of Arden. And the role of the moated manor house in medieval England was an important one. Typically, it's a fortified country house and the medieval manor was the administrative centre of court, which is the smallest organised territorial unit of the feudal system in Europe at the time. So if you held a manor house, you potentially held power, authority and rights of revenue from the surrounding farmland. Now, it's not quite as fortified as a castle. Manors would still have been able to repel a small armed band. However, if an army was large enough to evade, then the chances would be that the defences would in fact be overwhelmed and the Lord of the Manor and his family would be in peril. However, we shouldn't feel too sorry for this Lord of the Manor, as he would actually would have held legal rights and trials or sessions in the Great Hall, and it would, that would have been the dominating room in the medieval manor house itself, and something that we might actually revisit during the 3D reconstruction later. 
Now, the, the peak period in which motor sites were built was between about 1250 and 1350. And the moats weren't always practical. Uh, they didn't always have practical military defences or often used as status symbols for those of who were the aristocratic residences. Now, Coswell Hall and its park are first documented from the 14th century onwards in a lease jointly named with Kingshurst Hall Park. Now, it's important that we have recognised here that the lease joins Coleshill Hall Park and Kingshurst Hall um, and its park as well. So both may have been similar in character, with the small parks subdivided into woodland, meadow and pasture, and all of which would have received payment or service from the serfs and farmers on the land. So it's from the ownership of Kingshurst Hall and Coleshill Hall that the decades-long feud between the two families the De Montforts and the Digbys actually revolves. Now, their feud is so significant that eventually it impacts the wider landscape around Coles Hill Hall. The De Montford family used the two residences first, alternating between Coles Hill Hall and Kingshurst Hall. That's quite a common practice when you own quite a few manors. That was until Simon de Montford had to forfeit Coles Hill Manor when he committed various misdeeds and ultimately a treasonous attempt against the crown and followed insurrection against King Henry VII. Now, he was promptly locked in the Tower of London and during his imprisonment in the tower, the king granted his lands at Coles Hill to the deputy constable of the tower, a man called Simon Digby. So who have we got in the photo here? Is this Simon Digby? It's not actually. So this is rather strange looking chap is a guy called Perkin Warbeck. He's got a brilliant name. Um, he's also a rather interesting character. He's known as the Great Pretender. And it, Warbeck, Warbeck, sorry, Warbeck claims to be Richard of Shrewsbury, Duke of York, who was the second son of Edward IV and one of the so-called princes in the tower. So if you know anything about the Tower of London history, the prince locked in the tower is quite a sad and evocative tale of you know, woe and death, but definitely worth reading up on in your spare time. So yeah, that guy on the left is, is Perkin Warbeck, and we can actually blame the feud that happens in the families due to this great pretender. So the Montford was unfortunately later executed at the tower in 1495, so you can see why the de Montford family may have fostered some animosity towards the Digbys, but the feud gets worse. In 1520, the chief messages of both Coleshill Hall and Kingshurst were situated in their respective parks. Both parks were in the ownership of the Digby family and a complex web of leasebacks allocated to Coleshill Park to the heir and Kingshurst Park to the widow of Simon Digby. So just for your reference, a leaseback, if you're not familiar, it's also known as a sale and leaseback, refers to a financial arrangement in which the party is selling an asset, often a property, and in this case a property, leases it back from the purchaser. So this is generally a long-term arrangement, allowing them to use the asset but no longer owning it. So this will become important as we go through the story. So in 1627, Kingshurst was held by a lady Latisse, Baroness Offaly as dower, and Kingshurst and the other demenses of the manor of Coleshill were subject to serial disputes with the former owners, the Montfords. It was apparently resolved in 1527 in favour of, of the Digbys, but the Montfords claim it never went away. Sir Edward Montford sold his interest to Sir John Digby in 1615 for over £3,000, but negotiated for his widow, Dame Elizabeth, to retain her dower, to, to retain her residences. Now, on this pretext, their son, Simon Montford, took possession and was then soon sued by Chancery, uh, by Kildare Lord Digby in 1648 and again in 1658. So that's both before and after the death of Dame Elizabeth. So Robert, which is another Digby, and Simon Monford had to agree to binding arbitration by John Glanville in 1638, which must have failed. So later on, an action of trespass and ejectment of common law was brought by Simon Mountford, gent and plaintiff, and Kildare, Lord Digby defendant in 1657. Litigation was ongoing in 1660, and whatever the outcome, Kildare, Lord Digby, died in Dublin in 1661. Right, so there's quite a lot of information there. 
a lot to follow. I think I could benefit from a brief recap because I am a bit lost. There's a lot going on there. So we've we've got two main families. They don't like each other due to um, one of the kings giving Coltill and by association Kingshurst over to the Digby family. They try and keep it in the family by com complex verb of those leasebacks, so selling it on but then renting it off, and it gets more and more ingrained. And the families get further and further away from resolution and eventually start doing serial litigation against one another. Uh, Lady uh, Latisse uh, is just an incredible character in history, and she's really well known for her countless kind of court hearings where she's constantly fighting for things uh, so she's a really interesting woman to sort of look into and she's probably one of the main reasons why Kildare Digby uh, goes on to fight the Montford so hard for the land so we've got two houses uh, they're not agreeing they're fighting over Coltall Hall and Kingshurst and due to the indentured nature of ownership this fight goes on for well over a century. Great so, and do we know the end outcome? We'll come on to that now. So yeah. the litigation may in fact be actually be very significant for the history of Coleshill Park. And as you can see in this next slide, um, the park pale was drawn by Snape in 1783 and is continuous anti-clockwise from Coleshill Hall to the northern edge of Over Homesall, which was one of the domains enclosures in dispute with Simon Mountford in 1658 to 1660. Now, the inner perimeter is punctuated by a single row of trees, which likewise uh, begins at Coatal Hall and continues down to the rather nicely named Withy Sitch on the western boundary. The design is incomplete owing to the unresolved dispute between the two families. So with the onset of almost constant litigation between the Montfords and the Digbys, accurate records of the Elizabethan Hall are actually far more forthcoming. And our earliest cartographic source is from Snape's 1783 map. Now, in 1628, however, there's a room by room inventory of the contents of Coleshill Hall, which is now kept in the British Library, should you wish to look it up further. And it basically says that the inventory was taken on the 5th of April, 1628, of all the good chattels and implements of the household in Coleshill Hall. And it goes on to list all the details there. So basically it shows that uh, the, the Digbys retain ownership. Um, and if you go to the local church in Coleshill, you will find a rather lovely tomb of the Digbys there. So they've basically won, they've asserted the most power on the land. Now, together with Snape's engraving, we're able to build a rather lively view of the Elizabethan Hall. The hall is shown in two 17th century views, and these show that the house was actually Elizabethan in character and built loosely following the E shape, you can guess why, um, in plan. So this is quite common at the time, this was a way of showing your kind of reference to Queen Elizabeth. Now the appearance of the hall is confirmed by an engraving shown in Snape's map, again from 1783, it's a very important map. And we can also see a stable block on the left-hand side of the image. And it's actually this stable block, which gets converted into the farmhouse, which we know now as Coleshill Hall Farm and that's the designated grade two listed building. Now, excitingly, Snape's map also records the presence of two structures within the gardens to the north of the manor in the angles of the half octagonal moat. So it's probable that these were the garden pavilions that will actually later remove to Ettington, so that's to the south in Stratford-upon-Avon. Although extensively modified when they were eventually re-erected in Ettington, they still survive to this day. So we can, can then infer from that that it's likely based on stylistic grounds that the pavilions were contemporary with the construction of the Elizabethan manor and indicate that the gardens and associated manor are likely to have been elaborate and formal with Renaissance features such as those pavilions. Now on that same 1783 map we can also see the presence of a driveway and a walled forecourt to the east of the manor and formal gardens to the west. Thank you for watching the first part of our Heritage Talk on Uncovering Coleshill.